My name is Murray Richmond. I'm pastor of the First Presbyterian Church here in Medford, Oregon, and we're glad that you're joining us in worship online today, and we hope that it's a blessing for you. We, when I was a kid, we used to say things were righteous, meant that it was really rocking, it was really good. What does it mean that God is righteous and that we are called to be righteous? We're going we're gonna to look at that today and see how it means we are right with God and right with each other and right with the world around us. So I hope that God will feed you through spiritually through the words of the sermon this morning. Uh, if you want to come join us for live worship at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, we are back to requiring masks for worship. We would love to have you, but we do ask that you wear a mask. And if you're watching this and you haven't been vaccinated and you are a person that can receive the vaccine, I strongly encourage you to please go do that. The hospitals are full of unvaccinated people, and I don't want any of you to be in that category. I want us all to be healthy and safe. So take care of yourself, take care of your community. And again, it is our hope that God will bless you through this worship service today. this morning. Can you imagine? The wolf lives with the lamb and the leopard rests with the goat. Can you imagine? Knowledge of the Lord fills the earth. Righteousness reigns over all the earth. The Lord's light shines on a weary world, illuminating possibility, beckoning us to hope. With peace in our hearts, let us worship God.
The Old Testament lesson for us this morning is from the book of the prophet Amos. Hear the word of the Lord. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the gospel of Matthew. We're just doing one verse. It's out of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be fulfilled. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to start this morning by reading a couple of verses. Uh, They're going to be be similar to one another, but I want to see if you can tell the difference between the first and the second version of the verses. 
I'm going to start with this. This is from Paul's letter to the Romans. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Now hear it again with a little bit different translation. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of justice. Did you catch the difference? Instruments of righteousness present yourself as instruments of justice. Here's another very popular. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be yours as well. Or we could read it this way. But strive for the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things will be given to you as well. Or listen to the verse of the gospel lesson that I read. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now hear it again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be filled. Each one of those translations is a valid translation of the text. In fact, the Greek word diakasune means in, in English justice or it means righteousness. And to be honest, that's not really an insignificant difference. When most people think of the term righteousness, they, they tend to put that, that's a religious term. That, that's a term that's used in church. You know, you're righteous before God, you're right before God. When we think of justice, we think of politics and law courts and things like that. And it doesn't have that theological bent to it. But we have to remember that in the early church, often they borrowed political language to describe themselves. The word for church itself was a political term. The word for gospel was a political term. Um, And the word for righteousness or justice was a political term that the early church borrowed from the culture around them. Now, having borrowed them, they often changed it. Now, this begs the question, if the word diakasune in Greek can mean either righteousness or justice, how is it that it's mostly translated as righteousness in most English Bibles? In the English Bible, the NIV Bible, you find um, 14 examples of the word justice, but 72 for the word righteousness. But they all come from that same Greek word. So why the overabundance of use of the term righteousness versus justice? Well, the answer, I think, is fairly simple. The English Bible mostly came into being after the Reformation. And a big part of Reformation thinking, perhaps the main part of Reformation thinking, was our relationship with God, that we are to be right with God. The question they were facing is, how is it that we're right with God? To seek righteousness is to be right with God, but how does that happen? I think it's fair to say that the way they define that is exactly why we use the term righteousness instead of justice. We're making things right with God. In the reformer's eyes, it looked like this. Suppose you're standing before a judge and you're guilty of the crime. What do you do? What's going to happen to you? Well, you're going to have to to pay the penalty. The judge is required to to sentence you. You can't go up and plead guilty, and then the judge says, yeah, but I'm in a good mood today. I'm just going to let you off. That would not be a good judge. And in the same way, we all stand before God, and we're guilty. Guilty of sin. Guilty of not reflecting God's glory as we should. Guilty of doing things that we know we should not have done and of not doing things we know that we should have done. And God, as a judge, is required to judge us. And in this case, it's an eternal judgment. It's a damnation 
to hell. It's to be sent to a life of eternal torment because we were guilty and we went before the judge. But the way the reformers saw that is we're standing there and as we're standing there waiting for our sentence to be given to us, all of a sudden Jesus jumps up at the back of the courtroom and says, wait, 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 I will take his place. Sentence me instead of him. And Jesus comes and stands in front of us and so the judge is looking at Jesus and he says, I sentence you. And Jesus gets it and we're free free to go to heaven, free to spend the rest of our lives with God. That was one of, if not the main theme in Reformation theology. So when they came across the word diakasune, because they wanted to see us as right with God, they usually, especially the English reformers, translated that term as righteousness. Now, It might not surprise you that John Calvin, founder of the Presbyterian Church, was a lawyer before he became a theologian. And so he thought about these things in in legal terms, but he also thought about them in theological terms. Let's imagine a different scenario, though. In that previous scenario, the righteousness of God means that we are judged by what we have done, except that Jesus Christ receives the penalty for our sins. But think of it this way. We're standing not before a judge, but before a father who loves us. And we have done wrong. And we throw ourselves at his mercy. How is this loving father then to respond to us? You know, you might have been in that situation yourself where you have hurt someone that loves you very deeply. It might have been one of your parents. It might have been your spouse. It might have been a close friend. You've done something that hurt them, and now you're standing before them guilty. How is that friend, that spouse, that parent supposed to react? Well, I don't know, you know, and and I don't know what happened in your case, but Jesus tells us what happens when we do that with God. He told a story about it. You may remember a young son goes to his father and says, Father, I would like to receive my share of the inheritance now, which is in that culture essentially saying, Father, I wish you were dead and I had your money. Great sin against his father. And then he goes off and he squanders the money. The father's been working hard to make sure his sons have a share that they can live off of and they can be comfortable with. And the son takes his part and he goes and he squanders it in, in wild living, we are told. And then, you know, he finds out that uh, when you have a lot of money, you have a lot of friends. And after the money runs out, a lot of your friends dry up as well. And he ends up in a, in a sty feeding pigs, which... For a good Jewish boy, that's a very hard job to take. And he realizes that, you know, my father's servants have better jobs than this. If I go to his house, I'm no longer his son because of what I did to him. But if I go to his house and I can be uh, perhaps one of his servants, I mean, I'm sure he'd hire me or he would take me in and he would take better care of me than where I am now. So he goes to his father's house and he's got this speech prepared in his in his head father i have sinned against you please accept me as one of your hired hands and he's practicing that speech over and over again and and the father sees him before he gets out there the son never gets a chance to make the speech because the father runs towards him and throws his arms around him he says my son my son you're back you were once lost and now you're found you are back here with me i am so glad we're gonna have a feast we're gonna have a luau kill the fatted calf They're Jews, so they wouldn't have had barbecue. Kill the fatted calf. Bring him nice clothes to wear. And Jesus tells us that's the justice of God. That's the righteousness of God. God's love overcomes anything else that we have done. 
we may stand before God as guilty, but God's love overcomes our guilt. And you want to know how much God loves us? God was, and I don't know chronologically how this all works out in the divine plan, but God's trying to figure out what to do with those people on earth that just don't know how to get along with one another, and they're getting in all sorts of fights and feuds and, and all sorts of things. So he says, I'll send Jesus. I'll send my son. And my son can teach them how they ought to live. I created them a certain way, and they're not living the way that they were created to live. So I will send Jesus. Jesus will come to them, and he will preach to them. He will show them the way that I want them to live. And God does that. And we kill Jesus. We kill the Son of God. And yet, God still loves us. That is the righteousness of God. That is the justice of God. That love overcomes all. And so, whether we think of righteousness or justice, that is right living for us that we live a life of love. Our love should overcome hatred, should overcome suspicions we have of others, should overcome prejudices, overcome past hurts. Our love should overcome national prejudices and national boundaries. Our love overcomes sin because God's love overcomes all of those things. And we are called to live in the light of God's love. Those are great words. But can we do them? You see, justice or righteousness is partially about how we stand before God and how we are made right with God. But it doesn't stop there. And that's probably one of the biggest beefs I have with the reformers, in fact, with the Western church. Their notion of the righteousness of God was more about getting into heaven after you die than it was about our life here on earth, how we live a life of right relationships, of righteous relationships, how we live justly. With one another. Paul gives us some insight into these things. He writes that the dividing law between Jews and Gentiles has been broken down. Now, we read that church through the lens of a 21st century American. And it, it's hard to go back and kind of reappropriate it for what it meant to the readers of Paul's day because we have to go through centuries of Christian anti Semitism towards the church and also the context where we live today where where and while there is anti-semitism in america most people believe that jews are good people and that we all worship the same god and we may worship that god differently and people have different feelings about that but back in the day when paul was writing this jews and gentiles were like two warring tribes. They didn't understand one another. They couldn't get along together. Why would you think that? I can't believe you would think that about God. Well, what about you? How can you have so many gods? I mean, which one is it? Do you have one God or all God? Which is the top God? Which is the bottom God? Well, how do you guys have a God you can't even see? Uh, and, and they would go back and forth. And, and it's kind of like tribes today that we have, political tribes. How can you say that you like that person? How can you say you like that person? It was, it was more about the way their prejudices shaped and their religion shaped the way they lived. And they had a hard time coming together. But Paul tells us that in Christ, that dividing wall of hostility between 
Jews and Gentiles has been shattered. We are one people. It turns out that we're members of the same tribe. Who'd have thunk it? Here we are. I didn't realize that. And in the same way, Paul later goes on to write that in God's eyes, there is no Jew or Greek, no, lo- no slave or free, no male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. That also is the rightness, the righteousness, the justice of God. No Jew or Greek. Now, before Jesus came along, Israel, the Jews, thought of themselves as a nationality. They were the people of Israel. They were different from the Romans. The Romans were people of Rome, and the Jews were people of Israel. And that, that dedication to the nation states they belonged to separately divided them. And, and that was a hard thing for them to let go of. Even Jesus' disciples, as Jesus was about to ascend into heaven after his death, after his resurrection, after they had seen his life and heard all his teachings, the question they ask him is, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Can we become a nation state once again? They had a hard time letting go of the concept that in order to be the people of God, they had to be a country of God, a kingdom of God. And Jesus said, no, it's not going to work that way. You're looking for something that's not going to happen because what's going to happen is you're going to usher people not into the nation of Israel, not into any nation state, but into the worldwide kingdom of God. That is part of God's righteousness. That is the way God made us, that we should not relate to one another according to their nationality for the gospel knows no boundaries. Our first commitment is not to our country, but it is to the kingdom of God. And if we aren't committed to that first, then any commitment we make to our country is going to suffer and probably get in the way of our faith. You know, we used to think, many people used to think, if you're a good American, then you are a good Christian. Well, that's no longer true as our nation lets go of more and more of the Christian cultural trappings that they had once embraced. And so now a minority of Americans identify self-identify as practicing Christians. And I don't think that's bad. I don't think that's bad at all. It, it gives the church the entree to say, yeah, being an American doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is that you're a part of the kingdom of God. You're a part of the community of God. And whether you're an American or a Canadian or a Mexican or a Russian or English, whatever, we're all part of the same kingdom under the same king. Now, God also says there is no longer slave or free. That was part of the social hierarchies of the day. And Paul says there are no more social hierarchies. In the justice of God, in the righteousness of God, we are all equal to one another. This is a very radical thing to say in Paul's day, to say that a slave was the same before God as the master and that God did not respect the barrier that held them apart. Now, some societies have very stratified social standing, social classes. We think of the English class system. We think of apartheid in South Africa where everything's strictly codified, sometimes by law, or if not by law, then by practice over time. And, and it, it's a highly stratified system. In, in our country, it's less formal, but there's a pecking order. You know, pretty much any organization you're in, you're going to find out that there is a pecking order of some kind. 
But in the righteousness of God, the pecking order doesn't matter. Now, let me say this about this congregation here. And one of the reasons why when I talk about you with others, I, I talk with pride. I think we have embodied that. Not perfectly, because we're not perfect, but boy, do I think we've done a lot moving in the right direction on this. When someone comes to our door, we don't care if they're dressed in a suit and look very well healed or whether they're dressed in shabby clothes and are clearly unhoused. They are, they are welcome here. I have seen the way members of this congregation react to each other and then turn around and see the way they react to the people who hang around our church, the unhoused in our community. And if anything, I see that they are deliberately more caring for the people who seem to need it the most. I think that makes, that makes me proud, but I think that's the justice of God. That's the way God intended us to be. To not treat people according to the pecking orders. God wipes away the pecking order. In the righteousness of God, there are no pecking orders. God breaks through that. And I'm very proud of the way this congregation shows who it is that way. It seems like we have broken through that. The last thing that Paul says is that there's no male or female in Christ. And I, again, I think we do really well with that. Our society is getting much better about it, that we aren't divided by gender lines according to the kingdom of God. Back in Paul's days, things were pretty stratified. At, at the temple, there was a sign outside that was posted. You say you had your outer courts and anybody could go there. Then you had your inner courts. And to get into the inner courts, there, you had to pass a sign that said women, Gentiles, dogs, and other impure animals are allowed to go no further. Women, Gentiles, dogs in the same breath. Oh, we're light years beyond that. And, and I think we affirm the role of males and females in this church without necessarily assigning them gender roles. I think we, we do well with that as well. So we are practicing we are exhibiting the justice of God as we do that. Now, finally, so righteousness, justice, in a theological sense, means we're being made right with God. It means we enjoy right relationships with one another. But it also means we enjoy right relationships with the world around us. We, as a global society have not been doing well in that compartment. God created this world, and God put us as stewards of this earth. We are allowed to use the resources of it. They were given to us by God, but we are not allowed to abuse the resources the earth gives. We are to be in peace with the planet that we inhabit. And I think as we've seen, and this has just accelerated over the, the past few years, we are more and more divorced from the created world that God has given us. And when we're divorced from the world God has given us, I think that leads us into a divorce in a small way with God. We cannot fully honor Jesus as Lord. We cannot fully honor God is king if we do not honor God's creation, the world God has given us. And I think we're seeing the end results of our attitudes. We, we, we are just divorced. I, I, I had a friend that ran a health food store, and he was walking by a thing of potatoes, and one fell down on the ground, and he, he reached down to pick it up, and he put it back in, and a woman was watching it. And she said, why are you putting that potato back there? I'm going to call the manager. And he just looked at her and he said, ma'am, do you know where potatoes come from? I mean, they're, they're literally dug out of the ground, dug out of the dirt. And she was upset because he put a dirty potato on top of the other potatoes. I don't know if she really knew where potatoes came from. Barbara Kingsolver says in one of 
her books that she's in a diner and the young waitress came over to her and she said, oh, it's such a lovely day. I hope it doesn't rain. I'm going to the lake this weekend. Well, the area they were in was in the middle of a drought and rain was what they needed most. And this one person was saying she hoped it doesn't rain because in her little world, divorced from all the other natural systems around her, all she wanted was the sun to shine. Climatologists tell us that we may be in what is a new normal for us. 100 degree days plus for places like Portland and, and Seattle. Droughts, fires. Klamath County, 92 home wells have gone dry because we haven't cared for the planet the way we should have. And a lot of that is due to the fact that we can't control our own desires. You know, when I was growing up, you had fresh fruit in the spring and the summer and maybe in the fall, and then in the winter, you didn't have so much fresh fruit. You just kind of make do. We could get oranges from Florida and things like that, but you weren't going to get watermelon in January or strawberries in February. You had to wait for summer for those things to come. And now we can get them 12 months out of the year because we ship them from halfway around the world. We're sitting here, you know, in the middle of the northern hemisphere and we get them from the southern hemisphere. That means all that effort that goes into making marketing and getting them up to us takes a lot of energy because we like having strawberries in February. That's a small example. There are many, many, many other ways that this has played out to the detriment of our planet. I am told that if we were to go back to the consumptive patterns of the 1970s, climate change would not be an issue for us. And I was alive in the 1970s. I didn't think it was too bad. But there it is. And I guess that leads me as, as we end this, that God is not a big judge in the sky who's looking down, waiting for us to fall. God doesn't stand before us in a way that we should be afraid of him or feel guilty. Those are two very bad motivators, fear and guilt. But we are motivated by love, the love that God has for us and the love that we have for God. In love, God created us a certain way. And when we live in that way, when we live in right relationships with other people, right relationships with ourselves, right relationships with the world around us, we are reflecting the glory of God. Watching people having fun at a dance or a party is part of what the glory of God is all about. When people are getting along together and sharing and communing together, that glorifies God. When we appreciate nature around us and we care for it, that glorifies God. We were made for that. But sometimes our desires take us in the wrong direction in ways that we were not made. They take us to chase after things like money or fame or power or pleasure. And what Jesus said basically is you can have those things, but that's all you're going to get. That's going to be it. But you can have God and everything else will be added to it. Seek first the kingdom of God and then you will know the justice of God, the love of God. We're, not think we're used to thinking of justice that way. But that is exactly what we are called to do. The justice of a loving father who sees a repentant son standing before him and could do no other than reach out in love. We live in the righteousness of God, and when we do, we live in right relationships with one another and with the world around us. So may we be just and righteous people. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. O Lord, our God, holy God, just God, righteous God, we stand before you. Sometimes we stand before you in judgment because we have not been the people you created us to be. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We sometimes don't even love ourselves. And yet we stand before you. And that is what ushers us further and further into your grace as we come to you, as we come to you for healing, as we come to you for hope, as we come to you looking for life, abundant life, real life, as you show us what it means to be in proper relationships with the other people in our lives, where there is no Jew or Greek, no slave or freeman, no male or female, but we are all one in Jesus Christ. Help us to live in that world and help us to continue to create that world for others so that they also will know the wonderful justice, the wonderful righteousness of God. And as we think about others, we think about what they need in prayers. We pray for Sean Ashenberger, who's undergoing health problems at this time. We pray for the family of Glenda Crenshaw, who's an elder at First Phoenix and several family members suffering from COVID. We Pray for and give praise for Ansley Herrick and the folks at Phoenix First. She is their new minister and the director of their community center, and we pray for her as she begins her journey there with that congregation, and we pray that you would bless them and bless her work here. We continue to pray for Helen McKee, who's recovering at home after surgery on a broken leg. We pray for all of those people who are suffering from COVID at this time. And for organizations, churches, workplaces, restaurants that are being affected by that and for those who are having to make hard decisions in tricky times, be with all of us as we try to do what is best for the people we serve. We thank you for those who have acted responsibly and have done those things which would help stop the spread of the disease and pray that others would join in that movement and that we would put aside politics and prejudice and work together to put an end to this pandemic. We pray for those who are fighting the fires that are springing up around us. We pray for those, which is almost all of us in this area, who are affected by the daily barrage of smoke in our communities. We pray for those who have been displaced by the fires. And we pray for those who are responsible for the upkeep of our planet, that they would make wise decisions and that we ourselves would learn to desire after the things you want us to have and not necessarily the things society is telling us we need, even as those things are choking us to death. We pray all these things in your name and we pray them as your disciples and we come before you praying the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you go from here, as you leave watching this service and go back into your everyday lives, go as the just, righteous people of God who know and are still learning what it means to be in right relationship with God, right relationship with each other, and right relationship with the world around us. And may the love of God fall upon you like a soft summer rain. May the grace of Jesus surround you like the air you breathe. And may the power of the Holy Spirit work in and through you now and forevermore. Amen.